Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ whose powers uplift. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. That's page 94 in your hymnal, and you might want to flip to that in a minute right now. It's the other doxology. Y'all ever sang that one before? Yeah? I was at a church that uh, sang that all the time in a seminary. And I found myself doing something that my dad always did growing up, and it annoyed me to no end. And now I do it, and the circle is complete. And uh, <laughs> I found myself making up lyrics to, to the songs, new lyrics. Because you see, what happens when you're in seminary is you start paying very close attention to what you're saying in worship. Because what you say matters. It matters deeply. And so I, I, we were, I was listening to the words of this hymn, and after singing it many, many times, we got to the, that second part, and I just, I, I sang this. Praise God, the, uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Oh no, second verse. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, we don't know what to say about you. Oh, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. I don't know if you ever noticed that, right? Because we, we say something about God the Father, the source of all of our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit. What do we say? We don't know what to say, so we just repeat ourselves. Holy Spirit. It, it, it always just bothered the daylights out of me that we, we just don't know what to say about the Spirit. And so we will never sing that doxology here, because I can't promise you that I won't do that in front of you, and that would be very distracting. So uh, we'll stick to the old, old standard, the one that uh, is actually even more ancient. Uh, it is amazing to me that um, when it comes to the discussion of the Holy Spirit, uh, she is ignored. She is actually the correct pronoun for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in Greek and Hebrew is feminine. Ruach in Hebrew and pneuma in Greek. They're both feminine nouns. So the actual pronoun is she. But... Um, when discussing the Holy Spirit, that's the one that we end up just kind of getting lost and tongue-tied when it comes to that. We, we know what to say about the Father, Father who, who creates all that is around us. Then we start talking about the, the Son, and the Son who, who redeems and who's our, our Savior, and, and, we look, and we know exactly what to say about them. And then we get talking about the Holy Spirit, and it's like, well, there's a Holy Spirit out there. You know what to say about it? Let's just repeat ourselves. Holy Spirit. And that tends to be what happens. We get very confused talking about the Holy Spirit. And I think part of what helps us know what to say about Father and Son is the, the relational aspect, right? If you want to ask who Jesus is, well, Jesus is the Son. Ah, if there's a son, then there's a father. We know a bit about fathers and sons. A father is the one who's sort of in charge, and then the son does the will of the father. And, and we, we keep in, in that relationship between father and son, we understand something significant about uh, who God is. And then we get the Holy Spirit, and we forget the, the importance of holding it all in, in a relationship. It's a divine family, and so we need to understand the Holy Spirit in relationship to father and son, or else we just get kind of... You know, vague. Holy Spirit. Yippee. Right? And so, last week we started talking about the Holy Spirit. And one of the ways that the Holy Spirit is in relationship to the Son is that the Holy Spirit is always confirming the Son in our lives. When we are walking in the footsteps of Jesus, when we are doing what Jesus did, it is the Holy Spirit that moves in us to confirm that as right and true and satisfying. We talked about, you know, the, if you follow Jesus, well, what are you doing? You're, you're getting up early in the morning to pray and to study. You're serving others. You're putting others good before your own, loving your neighbor as yourself. And that's not exactly the most appealing argument to make. Right? You want to be happy with your life? You want to be satisfied? Work on someone else's satisfaction first? That doesn't make sense. 
But it does because of the witness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It is satisfying and we know it to be true. And so we were talking about last week the way that the Holy Spirit confirms that when we are following in the footsteps of Jesus, that this is what is true and satisfying and good. But there's something else the Holy Spirit does. It's what Jesus describes. He talks about how the Holy Spirit will act to guide us into all truth. Right? will guide us into all truth, which implies that we only have some of the truth now. There's much that we have to learn. And, and does the Holy Spirit guide us into all truth and to guide us in the best way to, to grill a steak? Right? Is that what the Spirit does? Does the Holy Spirit guide us in the, the most effective way and to potty train a child? That'd be useful. But that's not really what the Spirit is guiding us into. The Holy Spirit is guiding us into all truth about who Jesus is and where Jesus is active. The Holy Spirit both inspires and confirms when we are in the footsteps of Jesus and then confronts us when we are not. Right? To read the passage about the Holy Spirit lead us, leading us into all truth, the truth of following Jesus, then uh, it's important to hold it in relationship to the Father and Son because if we don't, and, and the Holy Spirit gets to be this sort of vague feel-goodedness, there are two temptations we, fall, we may fall into. One is the temptation to say that this is already good, God's blessing this, so why should I change it? Right? This is what we saw in the early church when uh, all the Jews who followed Jesus were in Jerusalem and they're Jews following Jesus who's a Jew and other Jews are coming to them and so they're all with people they're comfortable with. Jews hanging out with Jews, talking to other Jews about Jewish things. And, hey, Jesus is a Jew. Yippee. Right? And so everything is very comfortable. And then Peter takes a trip and we read about how this, he has this vision, this trance, and this sheet, something like a sheet is lowered, and all of the creatures that God have created are on this sheet. And, and God says to him, Petey, stop being so finicky about what you eat. And says it three times, right? So get over yourself. Stop being so finicky about the law. Relax. Have a steak, right? Have some catfish. And, and then the, that's what Peter hears. And then the, the rest of the story is that these uh, Gentiles, non-Jews, show up to say, tell us about Jesus. And so he goes and he tells them about Jesus. And um, all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, right? They, 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 they went and they, Peter went and told these folks about Jesus and the Holy Spirit's moving in their lives and they are committed and they're following Jesus and they have to go, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit, they look like Jesus? Huh. We might have to do something that's not quite as comfortable as we expected, right? So one temptation is to say God's blessing it, and we might, we never have to change. And, and the Holy Spirit confronts Peter and says, "No, uh, Jesus is over here too. You got to pay attention over here." Right? The other temptation when it comes to talking about the, the Holy Spirit leading us into all truth is grappling with um, if if it just becomes some sort of vague sense of the Holy Spirit makes us feel good about what's right. How many times do you do something that feel, feels good that's really stupid? Right? You sit down, you have a meal, and you eat as much as you want. Feels good, right? Eat as much as you can possibly eat. It's tasty. Was it, was it smart? No. It's stupid, right? You can overeat yourself into a real problem. Just because something feels good doesn't mean it is good. And, and so if the Holy Spirit just becomes this vague sense of, you know, if it feels good, it must be right going to end up in a world of hurt, right? The Holy Spirit is pointing us back towards Jesus. And uh, we read in the book of Judges, which is the Wild West of the Old Testament, what it looks like when people just do what feels right. We read, uh, it's in Judges 17. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did as he pleased. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. Right? And everyone did, did what was right in their own eyes. They did what felt good. I think it's right. Why not do that? But what they needed was a king, right? They needed a king to follow. They needed a leader to follow because, well, if you want to see what it looks like when everyone does what's right in their own eyes, read the book of Judges. Things get really, really crazy. It's a great book. It's an excellent example of what happens when everything goes. And so we need a, a king. We need a leader. We need someone who will both challenge us to lead us out of what is comfortable, but will also keep us rooted in following a, a leader. And so that is what the Holy Spirit is doing. It is keeping us pointed towards Jesus, confirming when we are following Jesus well, and confronting us when we are not. We seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit that might, we might be renewed by the transforming of 
our minds, that the same mind might be in us that was in Christ, that we, that we might be led into all truth. Now, as with most places in the New Testament, when Jesus says uh, that the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth, in most places in the New Testament when it says you, what it really says is y'all, we just need to think more Southern style, right? When the Holy Spirit is going to confront us and point us towards Jesus, it's not he's not confronting you individually, it's y'all as a whole, right? Y'all are led, so we all have to pay attention to what us all are doing, if you'll allow me to abuse grammar in that fashion. But I think part of the way that the Holy Spirit challenges us to find new ways, to find new truth, the, what more of the truth of what it means to follow Jesus, is through others. Right? Seeing what others are doing and saying, ah, that has the fruit of the Spirit. That might be something good and new and wonderful. And that's what happened to Peter, right? He has this vision where he sees all of the, the meat, that all the animals that he could eat and doesn't, and, and he has this vision that tells him, Petey, stop being so finicky. But what actually changes his mind is when he goes and he hangs out with the Gentiles and he has a meal with them. And he sees that they indeed can also follow Jesus. It's not enough just to have a vision and to think about it. What changes people is experiencing other people doing it differently. Right? If, if you want to be changed, you want to find out something that is new, it's not something we think about. We don't think ourselves into transformation. We go and we meet people and we see where the Holy Spirit's moving and we say, ah, we eat our way into transformation, eating with other people. Right. So to be led into all truth, we have to be with other people. We have to be with other people who are doing things differently, different ways of worship, different ways of being family, different ways of following Jesus, different ways of service. When these different people are following Jesus in different ways, the Holy Spirit will confront us and say, ah, maybe you need to consider some other options. Now, I'm not going to say that everything that is new is good, though, right? To say that the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, and you can't automatically assume if it's new, it's wonderful. We are, we're, we are this year in the anniversary of two things, one wonderful and one not. The wonderful anniversary is we are at the 60th anniversary of the Methodist Church ordaining women. And I think we can say, I know I can say, having served with many women who are ordained, that God calls women equally as God calls men. That's wonderful, right? That's a new thing 60 years ago. God led us into more of the truth of following Jesus. I am thankful for it. 60 years ago was also when we started to, uh, to have most of our pastors go to seminary. It galls me to admit this as someone who has spent $80,000 going to seminary, but what we're finding is there's no statistically significant difference between the effectiveness and growth potential between a seminary-trained pastor and not. Right? It turns out that if you take people out of communities and send them away into academia, that they learn a lot, but that doesn't necessarily make them good pastors. I can speak Greek and Hebrew, but I don't know if that's really... Man, right? Just because it's new doesn't mean it's good, but we have to kind of sit with it for a while to figure out, right? You can't just say, ah, it's new, it must be good. No, well, you got to stew with it. you got to see how it's going to work. Right? Now... Pondering how all this works, that the Holy Spirit both confirms when we are doing well following Jesus and confronts us when there is more that we need to know, it uh, has led me to struggle with something I've been struggling with uh, for years, really. It's a frustration that I have had with the church. And the frustration is this. I can't think of a single time when the church has just got it right. Right, you think across the last century about big moments that have happened, right? the resistance to Nazi Germany, the resistance to apartheid, making peace in Ireland, the 1960s civil rights movement, right? any of those, I can't, none of those was the church just like right on the front end of it, and, and all the church just said, ah, oh, yes, we should support this, or we should resist this. There's always a spectrum. Some support and some do not. And I can't... It, those are just the examples from the last century. As I look across like the wholeness of all the time of the church, I can't think of a single time when the church has just, all of the church said, ah, that's wrong, this is right, and, and just gotten ahead of something. Right? And it's frustrating to me, because I'd like to think we can do better than that. It did get me pondering, though, about how this actually works. Because if you look at each of these situations, in, in, in Nazi Germany, yes, the state church, the German Christian church, went along with, with the fascist party, but there was also the confessing movement that resisted, and there how the rest of the churches around the world knew what was really going on. 
Right? In apartheid, the resistance to South Africa and apartheid, yes, the Dutch Reformed Church supported the state and, and supported apartheid, but the Anglicans and the Methodists resisted and worked against it. Right? Yes, in the Irish Troubles, there were Catholic and Protestant terrorists, but there were also Catholic and Protestant peacemakers. And then in the 1960s in America, in the civil rights, there were plenty of pulpits that preached, why can't we just go back to how things were? There were also plenty of pulpits that echoed with the words of Martin Luther King Jr. I think that's part of how the Spirit works. Right? There is never a time when all of the church says, yes, we got it. But thankfully, there's always part of the church and then drags the rest of the church with us. That, and that's what, what we see. If you go back to the early church, that you remember that time I was talking about when uh, all, they were all Jews following Jesus and we just assumed everyone who's going to follow Jesus must be a Jew? That was an ongoing struggle for about 30, 40 years. Right? You can read about it in Acts 15. You can read about it in Galatians. You can, there are notes of it throughout the New Testament, this struggle between do you have to be a Jew before you can follow Jesus? And some people argued yes and some people argued no. But over time... They figured it out. Right? Over time, they figured it out, and the Holy Spirit moved, and some people said, yes, that's, that's it. That's where we need to be. The church is always all over the place on a challenging issue until it isn't. The church is always going to be all over the place, struggling with the newest thing that we're struggling about until we can finally say, okay, we got that figured. The Holy Spirit has moved, and, and we see them, and we've worshipped with them, and they're, they're right or, or they're wrong. We don't know. It's only when we see other Christians following Jesus differently that we will be able to discern whether that's of Christ or it's not. Right? The Holy Spirit is not some sort of vague, feel-good concept. It's not the third person of the Trinity to be ignored. It's the person of the Trinity that confirms when we are in the footsteps of Jesus and it confronts us when we are not. It is being open to the Holy Spirit that leads us to want to de desire to have a church that's a very big tent because I can't be changed by other people and led into all truth if I can't eat with other people. And so today we give thanks for the way the Spirit moves and we pray that the Spirit would help us to be open to other people, other ways of following Jesus, other ways of being faithful such that we might be led into all truth, one meal at a time. Amen.